I'm here, and you probably looked at the, uh, the, the paper, and you're like, set, you know, set phasers to JavaScript. Yeah, man, pew, pew, got all the lens flares. Uh, but I, I kind of did a little bait and switch here. The real title of this talk is Phaser JS and the rest of the owl. Um, you're gonna find that when you're working in this ecosystem, there's this constant push and pull, this coquettish push and pull between chasing the shiny. Oh, by the way, I'm Jesse. Um, I am, in fact, a terrestrial void expert, as was recently uh, featured in the news. And, uh, you know, it was whichever news has an American flag in their thing, uh, and also go vote. Um, hooray, freedom. All right, uh, so um, I do work at Simeon Craft, which is my company, um, and we do a lot of continuous integration and React and React Native and DataViz, and generally speaking, whizbang in your browser. You will see some whizbang in your browser today. We do that. Um, I am not listed on the program notes, so I wanted to just point out that Simeon Craft, we are a sponsor of Thunder Plains. And by we, I mean I am a sponsor of Thunder Plains. Uh, so I program a lot. Um, I did, in fact, learn a lot about programming from uh, composing music, uh, and I could talk about that uh, for a whole talk, and I actually I have. You can go check my slides.com. And these are my favorite people in the whole world. Um, so I've used a lot of game engines over the years. I've given talks about them. I gave a talk recently about Babylon JS. I made a scaffold for uh, Phaser in the past called Slush Phaser Webpack. I talked about Impact JS back in 2013. I've spoken in Kansas City about Phaser 2. Um, and I will tell you this, every single time you go to make a game, it feels kind of like, go check out the cool demos. Now, here's a game, it's on Steam. What happened in between these two things? And so this talk is a little bit about that. Uh, so, but lately I've been using Phaser 3. And um, I've been using Phaser 3 because it really has the important stuff. I mean, if you look at the anatomy of a game engine, there's things that you should expect to be there. There should be like a game loop. There should be some way to manage animations. Um, we're just gonna talk about some of these things. This is sort of the beginner uh, stuff that you should be looking for. And, and just to kind of back up for a second, it's like saying um, a car must have an engine and wheels to be called a car. And it really should have seat belts and it probably should have a radio. Phaser just checks all those boxes. Just be like, it's everything you expect in a car. By car, I mean game engine. So, you know, there's scene management and this is a little demo where every time I click one of these, I'm literally instantiating a new scene uh, and this is really pretty sophisticated scene management for a game engine, and that, right off the bat, in terms of the architecture, should be an indication that it's, it's probably a good choice. Scenes are really simple. Um, if you've ever worked in uh, React, anyone ever worked in React by show of hands? Yeah? Does anyone remember like jQuery UI back in the day, or am I, okay, yeah, that last talk, I was like, I lived it, and she was like, I was in middle school, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, uh, most game scenes are just a series of events that represent um, points in the life cycle of a game. Preload, go get all the stuff. Create, make all this stuff. Update, that calls every single time you update the game logic. Render, that calls every single time you draw a frame. That's really it, and then you can just go start a scene. That, that is enough to get you started and understand the demos that are kind of out there. Um, hey, it's a game engine, so physics, right? This is, uh, you know, there's some really fancy physics demos out there where it's a Rube Goldberg apparatus and it looks like a Google Chrome commercial, if you remember those. Um, Dada Chi did the music for that. Really like that guy. Um, this, you just turn them on, you say, I want physics, arcade. And there's a few other choices, but it's literally that simple. So that's ready to go. Um, there's a lot of cameras. Here's a really fancy demo where they've got many, many cameras and they're tweening between them and doing all this stuff. Uh, but the reality of it is you'll probably be doing something kind of like this. Um, set the camera on the player and follow it. That's, you might do more than that, and you can if you want, but that's probably what you wanna know to get started. Uh, so that's really what that create camera function does. You drop the failer in, and you, you drop the player in, you say start follow, and you're good. Um, there is a, a lot of tooling to help you with animation. There's not quite enough, in my opinion, which is why I've been working on the project that Jeff mentioned, but long story short, uh, preload, go get the stuff, create, prepare the stuff, uh, and then basically you can just play an animation, in this case, run. Of course, the patterns for organizing them, there's a little bit more to it. And of course, the ultimate whiz bang in your browser, particles, uh, they are magic and confetti, and really anytime you need a whole bunch of little things everywhere. Um, it has a really decent uh, particle system, and really any game engine worth its salt has this. Like, you know, if you ever used Unity, they had like the shuriken system and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, you, you declare it with JSON, uh, and then you create an emitter, and then boom, you got particles going everywhere. And in this case, the, uh, the image at the top, that flare is like a, it's literally just a fuzzy dot. You can make particles out of any image that you want. So what? There you go, there's your beginner to phaser. You can do all the basic stuff. 
actually, you can go peruse the docs and you can go peruse the examples and probably learn more than I could tell you in a relatively succinct talk. This is where we start talking about that part in between the first part of the owl and the owl, owl 1A, if you will. So the first thing is if you really do wanna make a game, you're going to want to somehow make game worlds quickly, and that doesn't necessarily mean that your game is going to work exactly like this. There are a lot of people who do it different ways, but here's some stuff that's out there. The first thing I'm gonna say, just right off the bat, go get you some tiled. And if you don't know what tiled is, it's an open source map editor. Uh, I think it's like tiledmap.org. You can literally Google search tiled and it's the first thing that's gonna pop up. And uh, this is a screenshot from a game I'm working on. And uh, you can probably see there's like a little tile map here and then you can go place them on here. And uh, if you don't know what a tile map is, uh, you basically, you load a tile map, you go edit a level, you export some JSON, you stick it in phaser, wow, there's your level. And that's how you make them. Uh, don't try to do this by hand by editing integers in an array. Um, this tile set, a very small thing, can make this big level, uh, which this is something I'm working on right now. Um, and you'll find that uh, you know, a really well-constructed tile set is very, very capable of making a very wide range of levels and a lot of different stuff. Uh, and there's a lot of resources out there for that. Um, the other thing that's interesting about tiled is you probably notice there's this little properties thing over here. Well, here I've set a custom property called collision, and then over here I've got like a little loader that's basically iterating all over the layers inside of uh, what came out of tiled, and then I can, for instance, make a layer collidable by reading the, that property. You're probably gonna start doing phaser by doing everything code first, and then you'll probably get to the point where, oh, actually, I'm gonna make a loader that will go read everything out of tiled and then process it the right way. Uh, so just right off the bat, be looking for saving yourself time by doing stuff like that. Uh, but then again, maybe you don't wanna do it that, you don't wanna do anything by hand. You wanna generate them yourself. Well, the most common technique for level generation is a binary space partition tree, if you've never heard of it, which this little GIF here basically describes it. You take a space and you divide it in half, and you take those two spaces and you divide them in half, and you take those two spaces and you divide them in half. You get the centroids, you draw lines between them, and then boom. Now you've got your binding of Isaac or whatever it is that you like to play for fun. And um, I actually built one of these some time ago. Um, this is called Chamber. So if you look down here at this little mini map, that's the level that got generated by using this technique. Uh, and you can walk around it with, it with this little, little dude. You can click a little button and click generate again and look, makes a new level. Um, with this one, you can turn on corners and change the amount of rooms and stuff like that. But these slides will be available and you can play with it and you can go check out the code. Uh, or if you don't want to do it yourself, you can just go use this guy's code because there's literally plugins that'll just do it for you. Uh, and it's a procedural level generator by uh, Anthony Mills. Uh, so that's, that's how people are doing that. Um, and then here's a little demo of his level generator with a, actually a nice tile map and not just a random one he found off of free game assets or something. Okay, so a lot of people have seen those first two things. A lot of people have not seen this thing. I'm just gonna go back to tiled for a second. This is the tiled auto mapper. And what that is, is it's actually a sophisticated find and replace tool that's built inside of tiled. And it's really, really powerful. And actually, um, if you go into the forums and read about this, you'll see I'm haunting them like, hey, any way we can run this on the command line? Because I'd really like to make a level processor generator and uh, he's actually pretty uh, um, receptive to it. So if you can imagine, these are three layers that are sitting on top of each other on the left-hand side. Um, so I've got like, these are the zones I want to operate in. And then basically, if you see an input tile in those slots, I want to replace them with this other tile. You're probably thinking, what's, what's the advantage of this? Why is this good? Well, imagine you have an input tile like this, right? There's only three, there's only two things here, really. There's a background thing and a foreground thing, just two tiles. But what happens is pretty magic. It'll actually replace the tiles based upon positions and search patterns. And you can actually do some really, really sophisticated stuff with this and save a lot of time. This means you can go through with two brushes and just make levels really, really quickly and then hit a button and then boom, it's gonna generate everything. It's gonna put everything in the right place. Even if it's not perfect, that's fine. Going through and doing cleanup doesn't take nearly as long if you can do something like this first. And I just wanna show you, this is me literally opening up the editor and hitting the auto mapper button with the rules. Uh, and, and to be clear, the rules are other tiled files that you declare inside of a text file. And um, if you go check out my project I mentioned at the end of this talk, you can actually see these rules doing this. And so here's the whole level, just like boom, I hit a button and then becomes fancy. Uh, and then here's kind of a close up so you can sort of see what's going, uh, going on here. 
So there's a lot of techniques for rapidly generating levels. BSP trees, uh, auto mapper find and replace. You should at the very least be working inside a tile if you want to save yourself time. And, uh, you know, and then there's even more sophisticated techniques beyond this, uh, distributing items with Poisson disk generation. There's, there's a lot of things that will save you time. And here's the thing, if you're wanting to make a game as a hobby project and it's just, it's just you there, you gotta realize a lot of these hobby games end up taking like five years to complete and it's not shocking at all because yeah, a lot of games is like you know, fun and prototyping, but a lot of it's just labor. It's kind of like uh, when I was writing orchestra pieces, like, you know, the idea is about 10% of it, and the rest of it is making sure you didn't, you know, write an oboe out of range or in the, the quacky duck part of it. It's just labor. Uh, so let's talk about taking control. This is another thing where you're going to start off, step one, you're going to do what the tutorial does. There's a, a million tutorials out there that's going to tell you to do animation like this. If the cursor's left is down, change the body's velocity like this. If the cursor right is down, change the velocity like this. And that's really great for a while. And then you're like, well, actually, I need to like, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, they're walking left and right. I'm, I'm the champion, I did it, first place, go me. Okay. What about idle animations and, and jumping and some of these other things you might want for your, uh, your player? Well, so you, you add a little more and you're like, this is kind of gross. This offends my sensibilities. You get clever, you're like, oh, I'm gonna swap in the direction with the template. You know, you can, you can do some stuff, but it, it's still gross. This is, by the way, this is my real code. Uh, you're actually looking at me feeling like that owl writing this code in real time. The thing is, is when you get a little farther along, you're like, well, what if there's like a jetpack? What if there's like sliding? Like, what if I wanted to conceivably make Mega Man or something like that where there's a lot of in-between states? Well, what do you do? Oh gosh, no, <laughs> what have we done? Again, this is my real code. I didn't stick with this, but this happened, at least at one point. And, and one thing in Phaser is the way that it handles animations is there's like a callback. So you have to like have one part to set the state and another part to kind of like reset the state. And it's, it's not good. So what would nice look like? What would it be good? Let's, let's think back. I mean, I'm someone who's very concerned with complexity analysis and separating concerns. There's like the animations, and then there's the input, like the buttons you push, and then there's the behaviors. There's like these three totally separate ideas, right? So let's, let's start there. Well, it'd be really great if I could just list out the animations like this in a way that could be consumed by the animation manager. So I don't do them all one by one. I, I can like load them up in a loop somehow. And um, fun fact, if you use uh, like you know, texture packers and some things like that, you can actually get a list that's kind of like this without, without a lot of work. So that's good. All right, well, what about the input? Well, it'd be really nice if instead of doing everything inside of those if statements, and this is still pretty iffy. There might be some things to improve, but it's a lot nicer. It's like, if I'm on the floor and I push down, I walk left. If I'm on the floor and I push, uh, you know, down, you know, if I'm on the floor and the direction right is down, I walk right. You know, if the missile button is down, I got missiles, I, I shoot them. But you notice I'm not messing with the details of what it means to shoot missiles. I'm just saying, do it, right? This is effectively a command pattern, by the way. It's kind of like doing a dispatcher with Redux or something like that. I mean, you've seen it a million other times. It's just a way to separate concerns. You don't go to a store and tell a chef to make you a sandwich with all the ingredients and the instructions for it. You just say, make me a sandwich and hold the tomatoes. You issue a command, put a little bit more data with it if you need to, but for the most part, you delegate that responsibility to something else. This is a good pattern. We use it all the time in business programming, right? Now, okay, let's think about this. If I'm idling, I could like turn around and go the other way, or if I'm idling, I could like walk forward, um, or I could crouch, I could start shooting, right? I, you know, or I could jump, shoot my jetpack. There's a lot of things you could do from the idle state. So what's a good tool for this? Well, it'd be really nice if I could declare it in a way where I could say if I'm idling, I could handle all these state changes, right? That would be very nice. And then of course I've left the inside of these functions blank, but Really, you would, you would load up an animation or play a sound or something like that, right? This technique is a finite state machine. That is what that is. And if you ever talked about people using finite state machines to manage player characters, this is basically what the code looks like. That, those GIFs you saw before is that part that's boxed out. But you probably noticed another thing. Like, there is a concept of walking, but there's also walking left, and then the act of turning, and then walking right. Like, there's, there's actually, it's not just walking by itself, right? There's additional information that goes along with it. Well, that's what these children are. You notice the child is the directions. There's this other thing called directions that I can composite in with each of these states that is a hierarchical 
finite state machine. And um, you'll have access to look at the code to see all this is working, but my advice to you is to think about how much capabilities your character needs and just start off using the right patterns and don't turn into that gooby upside down owl that I certainly felt like, right? Um, so really, this is great, it's nice, so I've got input and then it goes to the behavior and then it outputs an animation. Just thinking ahead, what if the thing driving the animations wasn't the input? What if it was timers making something patrol? Or it was something else in the game state, like for instance, you're near something else and it's gonna start looking for you, right? Think like a you know, Thief the Dark project, it was like, oh, who's there? <laughs> oh, just a cat. Right, <laughs> um, uh, what about like a trained neural network? Some people have done some stuff with that. They've had games where it's been completely driven by an artificial intelligence. The bottom half of that, you can keep that pattern the same. You actually understand all that stuff. You just need to replace the input part with something else or maybe a little bit more autonomous. So you're actually well onto your way to implementing a fairly decent AI system. You just need to figure out what your decision making is. That could take a very long time, so I'm just gonna kinda hand wave there and be like, you're already on the right track. Don't write a bunch of if statements to control your character if there's sufficient complexity. Okay, uh, so I've talked about making levels quickly. I've talked about controlling your character. I think these are two big valuable pieces of data and where a lot of time gets uh, lost. But I'm just gonna give you some phaser quick tips, some, some little things I've kind of picked up doing this. Um, the first one is, here is the pixel art secret handshake. Here you go. When you're configuring your game, set that to true, set that to false. You, want, you don't want any anti-aliasing in your browser, which is gonna make things look fuzzy, and you wanna make the pixel art mode true, you'll probably find that. But then here's the real secret part. Um, you actually need to set all this uh, CSS, like you need to set image rendering to Moz crisp edges, which is something I know everyone has on the tip of, oh yeah, Moz crisp edges. Mm -hmm. I ordered that at the chicken shack recently, you know. Whatever, I found it so you don't have to. Congratulations. Texture packers, use them. There's two options I know about. There is Shoebox, which is free, and then there is, texture, it's just called Texture Packer, uh, which is not free, but then I have to ask you how much is your time worth, and you know, uh, you'll notice in the Texture Packer, the one for $39.99, and they did not pay me to say this, there's a data format called Phaser 3, and hey, we're working in that, so that's really handy for us, right? So uh, you see this thing in the background? That was the pack sprite sheet for that mech guy you saw walking around, you know, so it'll even do some really clever things like rotate it and really smash it in place and try to take up as little space as possible. This is the thing that everyone's using, just, you know, get this and save yourself the hours. Um, consider systems music. This is something that I really wanted to have more content for in this talk, um, but what I mean by systems music is uh, most people when they're going to make a game, they're probably gonna go, okay, now I'm gonna go open up Pro Tools or Audacity and I'm gonna like record some music and I'm gonna like load it. And that's probably gonna be the biggest thing you load in the game, like realistically, unless you're like actually loading videos. But it's, it's a large asset. Uh, even all your sound effects added up is a large asset. So remember how with a level, we're taking this small piece of art and we're cleverly tiling it and spriting it and doing these things and reusing pieces. We're doing this because we're being clever about visuals. Even very clever games like that, like You've probably heard of No Man's Sky. They're using like super noise and stuff to generate planets, right? But when you go achieve something, they just play a sound clip, right? Interestingly enough. There actually is a wealth of information in this realm about systems music. So here's the 101 example. This is Brian Eno, and you might not be able to hear this, but I'll try and turn it up as loud as I can. Yeah, you can't hear it. <laughs> to share the system itself. That is to say, the system could be packaged alongside the game, and it could be a lot smaller. And furthermore, because you're sharing the system itself, it can respond to the game state, which is pretty interesting. Um, here's another, like, and these are the simplest examples. I just wanna get you thinking about this. You could go record a drum beat, or you can... <laughs> well, what if, uh... package size is gonna be a lot smaller too. So just consider that. This is something I'm working on right now for uh, Create Phaser app. Uh, this is gonna be the next iteration is, is making systems music a little bit easier on everyone. 
Uh, so pros and cons. Um, pros, generative. That's pretty cool, especially if you're making a roguelike. I actually don't know any roguelikes right now that also are using systems music. They're using systems to generate everything but the music. I'm inspiring you to be someone who does this. I'm going to try and do it. Join me. It'll be fun. Uh, looping's not an issue. You don't need to worry about all that kind of stuff because it's systems music. It's usually a smaller footprint. It can respond to the game state. And Tone.js is what all those examples are in. So I'm going to say, why don't you look at Tone.js? And um, for your, and I should have written this down, uh, Haller.js, which was written by, I don't even, is James even in here? It was written by some folks in Oklahoma City that basically made the best tool for just managing sound clips and stuff like that inside their game. So Tone.js and Haller.js are the two you should look at. Here are the cons. The results might be unpredictable. Something might happen that you don't like. So that's, you gotta be aware of that. And it is actually just, it is more demanding of someone as a musician to write music and systems music. It, you know, I'm saying like, ah, oh, just do it. I mean, I've got like a degree in music composition, so I obviously have invested some time in this, but um, my hope is that if the tools lower the barrier to entry, uh, then maybe we have more people experimenting in this space and it won't be something that, you know, you. You go see in you know, the auditorium at a master's music recital anymore. Okay, extrude your tile maps. This is another little quick tip. Probably should have moved it a little earlier because it's a pretty small tip. But do you see this dude walking around? How there's a, like this stuttering inside of the uh, inside of the tile map? You need to actually go to every single tile and make it one pixel wider to prevent that. That's a that's a bug in just WebGL. Uh, so here's an example of it. And there's a tile map extruder that you can just go get and make it part of your, your standard pipeline. And then finally, use Create Phaser app. This is my project. This is the thing that I'm here to tell you about. And the thing is, is I'm making two games right now. One is the, the, the mech guy you saw was for a game called Signal Overgrowth. I'm also working on another one called Griffin. It's gonna be a spooky game uh, set in Oklahoma. Um, but the important thing is, is uh, yeah, is, it, some of you probably got that, especially if you're in Norman. Um, Signal overgrowth uh, is my attempt to suck at things and then learn from it and then take the things that worked out and put it into some sort of reusable tool. And that reusable tool is Create Phaser App. So what that means is the tile map extruder is part of a build process inside of Create Phaser App. The Webpack build is already put into Create Phaser App. Um, another project that I care deeply about that I do is ES6 Play-Doh, which is for complexity analysis. It's in Create Phaser App. Um, so it's not like create React app where it is like, it's just what you need. It's totally bare bones. Good luck with decorators. Um, decorators are already in Create Phaser app because they're awesome. Um, it is really just a way to get going and save time. And I will know if the project succeeded if it's game jam ready, which right now I feel like HTML5 games are, they're on the precipice of real accessibility because you, know, you go get Unity or something like that, you want to plug in, you click a button and poof, it's there. Cost you 10 bucks, here you go. And like HTML5 games development, we have actually so much more power at our fingertips. It's already built on a um, fully available platform to everyone. We have the power of NPM behind us. You can like go call Twitter and stick that in your game. Like all that stuff is just sitting there, but it's sprawled out everywhere. And it's like, rat it's like herding cats trying to get it all in one place. Uh, so that is the, the thing I've kind of noticed. And if you wanna, um, this is some of the stuff I was talking about. Uh, this is what I'm currently working on right now. You can go to this link and, and check it out. Uh, it's also got a build pipeline that will, um, you know, it'll take things out of tile. It, by the way, it is tightly coupled to tiled. Just heads up. Like, you're working in tiled if you use this because in my mind, you're, if you're trying to make something of sufficient complexity or size, you're, you're kind of like spinning your wheels if you don't, right? So more tiled integration. And uh, this is, this is it. If you go generate a project with it right now, you're going to get this. And I did all the art and stuff. You can shoot your little gun. You can walk and shoot. So if you want to see how all this works, go check out Create Phaser App. All the code's just sitting in there. And uh, it's a fairly new project. I just started it late spring, so I'm still actively working on it as much as I can. Okay. And finally, the last pro tip is don't give up. I know this is going to sound really silly. Because I just sat here, I'm like, look at all these things I learned. I put it into a framework. But let me tell you what, you are going to try to do this, and you're going to look at the demos. It's going to look really easy. And you're going to suck a little bit. And I did too, and that's OK. And I'm someone who programs a lot, right? So it's kind of like this. Start making a game. Oh my, this is hard. Making games is really hard. It's, it's really challenging. 
So here's me trying to make the, the guy that I turned into, uh, and like you see, like I couldn't figure out how to get the feet to stop buckling like a desperado, and I couldn't, I couldn't get it right, and I just like, I literally went through so many iterations, and I was just like, I haven't even made a game. I'm just messing around in Blender. This is terrible. Um, you know, obviously I mentioned the, the situation with the banding, but like, this is what the old art looked like, and it's like, not good. Like, I mean, it feels very amateur, and I think the thing I showed you was a little bit of a stronger offering in terms of pixel art. So I spent a long time just watching videos and trying to not stink at that. And this was my death animation that I haven't put in the game yet, but that is like, I'm like funny that the that you dying turned out pretty okay, you know, but everything else is bad. Um, and then here's a, let's upgrade Phaser. Oh, there's a new version out. And then um, Mambo Number Mech. So this is real. And then he just derps off into the sunset. Um, so if I can remind you, um, hey, sucking at something is the first step to sort of becoming good at something. From Jake the dog, right? He's right. Jake the dog is right. Uh, so that's really all I got. Um, I tried to put a lot of time for kind of questions. Uh, if you want to tweet at me or you know send me weird things, I'm at Simeon on Twitter. I'm the Simeon on everything else. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I have right about 10 minutes. It looks like I'm at 27, uh, 27 minutes right now. Yeah. Yeah, I've used that. Okay, let me back up here for a second. So I've used a lot of them, um, Akihabara, just because I'm gonna compare those, I'm gonna kind of put everything in sort of context. So there was another, there's another deck I have on slides.com, which is me doing, it is literally the game engine Safari, but it's also from about four years ago, where I went through as many game engines as I could get my hands on at that time to evaluate them. And at the time, I was actually telling everyone to use Impact.js, mainly because I had a level editor called um, Worldmaster. And um, one of my NPM projects is Impact, Weltmeister, but Worldmaster. Uh, I took it from PHP and ported it to Node. So Node Impact Worldmaster is my project. So where I'm going with this is, all of these things, and I can't remember specifically with that engine what features it does and doesn't have, but I can tell you right now, the things that, it's just like what I said about that car at the very beginning, right? Like, they, if it doesn't have wheels in an engine, it's probably either a buggy or a boat. Like, it's like, no, it's like not really a game engine. Now, does that mean you have to have a game engine to make a game? Absolutely not. You can have a game that is effectively like clicking links inside of an HTML page and then you, you call it Mafia Wars and make it really addicting and everyone plays it way too much. Like you can make a game out of anything. I, I think um, a section I wanted to have in this talk was like more like the sort of like shit but Theseus flavored existential, like what even is a game, man? Like the things that people in the art community ask themselves a lot, but like we seem to have like a very uh, solid opinion of what they are. Like have you ever thought about the fact that the first Nintendos were more successful over the Ataris because we loaded them like a VCR instead of top down and they weren't, they weren't called video games, they were called like game packs, and like there's a lot of, uh, a lot of our perception on these organs that make a game uh, system, are, they're really working against us in a lot of ways. I think that's why systems music hasn't taken off as a, as a more prominent player in, in game design. But anyway, to compare these things, right now at this exact moment, Phaser is probably the most feature complete engine, so I can say that with a great deal of certainty. Um, mainly because there's just more people cobbling on it than anything else. And, you know, I mentioned there is that texture packer program and tiled. They have treated this as a first class citizen. And the other thing is, um, and I didn't go into this, but I consider editing it, is um, if you're going to make art assets, because that's really what takes a ton of time, right? Um, first of all, for pixel art, you're looking at a sprite and pixel edit. Um, if you're looking for animation tools for 2D animation, you're looking at Spline, Dragon Bones, um, which is still mostly in Mandarin, but hey man, it's free. Um, actually, if you go look at Dragon Bones integration with Phaser 3, I'm the person who got them to do that, so hey, cool, right? Um, and then uh, Creature Creator and Spriter. Spriter's available in Steam, actually. Um, all of these already consider Phaser 3 to be a target for exporting. That means, what I've told you about reusing art assets, like I told you I had a sprite map. That means I have the same sprite over and over. That means you can make a piece of art where you can actually put the arms in and the body and, and um, use, uh, what's the word, a translation to move the bones around basically. You can put kinematics inside of a 2D thing. Results in a much smaller asset. I didn't include it because I don't feel like that's prime time for Phaser 3 yet. It was fully included in Phaser 2. So 
first of all, phaser is probably going to have it if the other one doesn't. It's going to have a good particle engine. It's going to have all these things. But the thing that makes it interesting is all these other tools consider phaser to be a first-class citizen in terms of targeting it for export. And the thing that's going to make you spend the most time is working on these larger pipelines. I'm, I'm convinced of it. It's like herding cats. Uh, so without going by a blow by blow on the features, I would say just right off the top, like I don't see that game engine being a target export inside of Texture Packer, but Phaser 3 is, for instance, right? So um, there's probably a lot of small minutia, but that's the big difference is, is Phaser is a, it's, it, its popularity is actually helping it be noticed by all these other things. Yo. Uh, okay, good question. Uh, so the main author is a guy named Richard Davey. Um, he is across the pond from us, so I have to read his messages in the morning every time he gets up. I believe he has got an HTML5 games company. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of people with, their, with other games companies that are they're kind of cobbling away at it, uh, and they're, they're adding to the community. Uh, so it is open source. Uh, I don't remember if it's like MIT or Apache, but it's, you're fine. I mean, you can use it. Uh, and uh, there's also some confusion about the versions of Phaser you can use, and this is a good opportunity to mention this. Um, there's Phaser 2, and then you'll probably find a bunch of articles about Laser, and then there's Phaser CE, and then there's Phaser 3. So basically, you want to go to Phaser 3, um, unless you need Phaser 2, and then you probably want Phaser CE. So they made Phaser 2, uh, and then they're like, oh, we're going to totally rework this and, and use modules and stuff, and we're going to call it Laser. And then that project died, and then it like came back, and then they took Phaser 2, and they made a branch for the community to be able to make pull requests to and stuff like that. And then you can just kind of forget all that, and then Phaser 3 is, in fact, their latest creation, and it's running correctly, and it's fine, and it's open source, and, and there you go. And uh, my goal with Create Phaser App, just to kind of plug it one more time, is to fill in the, fill in the mortar in the places that are missing, and then make a, um, an opinionated decision that it really should be working with Tiled, and you can, you can put properties and things inside of the properties pane in Tiled, and you can consume Tiled levels and work more quickly that way. Yeah. Well, you're uh, you're basically looking at JS physics engines, right? So, you know, if you're wanting to make, uh, I mean, what would be a good example, like Portal or something? Like, what would be a great example of a physics? Okay. You can do that. Okay, yeah, so I'll just talk about that for a little bit. So there are multiple physics engines, and they're not all exactly the same. If anything, you're going to trade, you're going to trade capabilities of the physics engine for performance, usually. Like, if all you need is like solid body collisions of rectangles, like that is relatively quick and inexpensive, and Arcade works really well. But if you need something a little bit fancier, that like, well, these are balls, and this thing's like heavier on this side, and you know, stuff like that. You know, there's, there's you know, P2 physics and there's Matter.js. Matter.js seems to be the most popular one. So the fact that Phaser is written in a way that the physics part is effectively, uh, I guess it's a plug-in pattern, actually does make it a good candidate because there are other JavaScript engines that are tightly coupled to whatever physics that person pulled off the shelf, right? So I would say compared to every other JS engine, yeah, it's probably fine. But I mean, again, you know, what are you going to be using if you go pull Unity off the shelf? You know, like Bullet and Havoc or whatever, you know, whatever, right? So uh, that's the best answer I can give there is you do have options when it comes to physics. Any more hands? Just people rubbing their head? That's cool. All right. Well, uh, I'm done about five minutes early. So thank you very much for having me, and I hope you check out my project. Take it easy.